What do you think will be next for you then? Well, I don't know. I'd like to make uh, more documentaries. That really matters to me, um, especially documentaries which are about difficult subject matter. Um, and my passion, which of course is modern and contemporary history. And, you know, be that about the Middle East or about legal aid, for example. Um, so two things, obviously. Um, one of the things I'm convinced about nowadays is that the way in which social media influences and shapes and curates the political debate is terrifying and problematic. Mm -hmm. Well, it's problematic first and terrifying second, because most people aren't on it and they don't care, right? So very few people who are the shoutiest and the loudest get the capacity to shape the cultural and the political agenda in a way which means that politicians are losing out on the real lived voices of people beyond the Twitter sphere. Uh, and that's what we saw in the last election. It's why places like Bolsova and Sedgefield, which are tribally Labour and our conservative constituency, that understanding of the lived experiences beyond the borders of London, for example. Mm -hmm. And as I said to you earlier, what really troubles me about that is that, especially now at the moment, um, now at the moment, especially now, um, communities that have the least power, be they communities of colour in, let's say, Lambeth, have so much more in common with communities that lack power in places like Tyneside or... Um, places around various parts of Merseyside, places in London. Um, no access to justice, certainly. No access if you've got a child with special education needs, if you're about to be evicted, if you're in crisis, etc. Whereas if you've got middle-class sharp elbows and the capacity to pay and the capacity to stand up to an authority and what's more, when somebody says no to you, the confidence and capacity to advocate on your behalf or behalf of somebody else access to the network your outcome is going to be completely different mm -hmm. and instead of those communities that lack power being drawn towards one another people who are in power are doing their level best to set them against oh, one yeah. another and that's what twitter does mm. and i and i i'd like us to be more able to think about ways of solving that issue and not by the way through the celebristocracy and I think the violence that they do in that space. But also I'd like to be able to um, talk about challenging issues in a way which people feel safe to do that in. So for example, you know, the way people think about the world often isn't in the in their political points of view, no longer sit in the logical cortex of the brain. So you and I kind of having a chat and in the past, you know, we might have radical different political philosophies, but we'd deploy our best arguments and we'd walk away and we'd still be friends and that would be that and meet for a drink and there you are goodwill nowadays again driven i think in significant part because of social media um where people people's political points of view their global positions on certain issues don't sit in that hemisphere it it seems to me that it's moved to the part of the brain where emotion and identity is governed and so consequently, if I want to have a discussion with you about something that's a bit difficult, I'm not so much as, even if I've got facts, um, I, I, you're not receiving them in that way. I'm actually attacking your identity. Mm -hmm. It becomes offensive. And that's impossible to have a discussion in those circumstances. And I understand why. It's personal, right? So in the difficult areas, the best way I think, I'm increasingly persuaded of changing that conversation is to um, have really good examples, to allow people the space to tell their stories. So for example, one of the programs I'd like to be able to make is um, about 1948 and what happened when Israel became a state. And to enable people, whatever your political point of view, you've got a political one, of course, for the facts to be, if you like the background, the um, part of the program, but really the chief program is just allowing people to say this, this is what this land meant to me in 1948. To say, I've heard your story, whether that's somebody who is a Jewish person of color who left Iraq or Yemen and found themselves on that ground, or whether that's somebody who's now a fourth generation Palestinian in um, a refugee camp in Southern Lebanon, 
standing on the ground who remembers the smell of the olive groves in Caesarea, which is now part of a Hilton hotel. The starting point is not for us to disagree, just to get out of the way and allow those individuals just to tell their stories. And the beginning of any good arbitration, and again, you don't see this on Judge Rinder, you know, you see the, the more, of course, kind of uh, dramatic parts of it, sometimes the funny bits, but at the beginning of every case, however silly it may be, but especially if there's toxic family break breakdown, I'll spend a lot of time doing this, and all the cameras, etc. This is an opportunity for you to hear one another. So at the point saying, I have heard you, I'd like to tell you a story. And often you really achieve, not reconciliation, but the beginnings of the process of people moving forward with less conflict, internal and within their families, just by forcing them to be in a space where they've heard one another. They've understood what something that the other person has done has meant. Or what, for example, it's not about the money, it's what the money has meant to them. And that's really true as well of big geopolitical issues as well. And I, I'd like to be able to make kind of programs that reflect that. Yeah, I think, well, let's hope we see you. Let's hope we see you doing it. <laughs> yeah, well, we have to get the money to do that. So, um. <laughs>